Welcome everyone to a new episode of Great Sound Lab. And I'm super, super happy that uh, Axel Grell is again back with me. So he's taking a very quick break from building a lot of headphones. And <laughs> I'm very, very grateful for that. So um, yeah, we, we can finally spend some time to talk about uh, the Harman research in detail. So over the last uh, episodes, I talked quite a bit about it. Um, about the methodology, what Sean Olive and his team um, accomplished, and it was amazing. So um, they did really the largest scale audio preference research in, in history. That's amazing. Their goal was to find really the, the biggest preference rating they can get out of a certain frequency response. And um, the results so far have shown that it's repeatable, that on average it will mostly converge to that sort of curve and that it will be generally quite liked. Um, and, and so his goal for his research is absolutely accomplished. And now we are here to talk about maybe where there's still room for more research and more importantly, how the research that has been accomplished is, uh, was maybe interpreted not quite the right way. And I'll go right into the detail with that because there's a very certain behavior online which always makes my blood boil. And that is um, that you see reviewers taking a, a target curve and like in the past five years it was mostly Harman and now it has been superseded by some by some tilted diffuse field response of the measurement coupler. Um, but generally they have a target curve and then they just measure a headphone and then they see where it deviates. So sometimes it has a bit more bass, sometimes it has a bit less bass and they say this headphone has too little bass and it's a bad headphone. Or the other way around, this headphone has a little bit too much bass and this is now a bad headphone. So if it is exactly on target with a Harman curve, then it's a perfect headphone, 10 out of 10. And if it has 3dB too little bass and 3dB too little in the midst, then it's a bad headphone, it's 5 out of 10. And now I want to ask, uh, ask Axel, what is your opinion on that and why is it maybe not the best approach? <laughs> yeah, so uh, there are a lot of headphones outside that are really great and really doesn't fit in, in the uh, Harman curve or any other uh, curves, they, but they are great headphones, they sound great. And uh, when you see, uh, yeah, is the Harman curve really something that is great for everybody? Uh, no, it isn't. So when we, I understand the methodology and it was really good that Sean did what he and his team did and, and it was really a lot of work and brought headphones or yeah thinking about headphones and all understanding of measurements and all that much further than before there was a lot of really bad headphones in the market beforehand. Yeah. Today it is it should not all just converge to okay it measures on a coupler like that, uh, according to the Harmon curve. So they will not sound the same. This is the good thing about it, but it's not the only criteria that we have uh, to, to yes, say, okay, headphone sounds good to me. So a lot of other things. And we will talk about this uh, in this little discussion here. Super. Uh, th thank you. So, uh, so I think that is one big element. So first, to just look at reality and see that there's a lot of headphones out there that, that sound amazing, even though they don't really fit the Harman target. And also sort of overlooking the specific results of the Harman studies, because what people see is they have 10 papers and think this is a great Harman research. Uh, and there's one line and that is all that comes out of it. But the reality is there is so much interesting detail knowledge about it. Yeah. So there were a bunch of headphones, for instance, in the Harman studies that were statistically tied with a Harman target. So um, it was for sort of popular and not super expensive headphones. So something like the DT990, something like the Sony MBR7506. So somewhat popular headphones. They all had in common that they had quite a bit of bass. Um, but for instance, the biodynamic one has quite a bit of trouble as well. <laughs> and, <laughs> and yet, in terms of statistics, um, you, they, they were at, of the same value as the Harman target. And um, that sort of shows that the Harman target is not necessarily the only truth, but that people, um, both individually and also on a large scale, may also like other tunings. So it's great that the team of Sean Olive found one uh, let's say one end to their question and the question was find a 
high preference target. They did that. But there's also other, other answers to that question. So that's very important to keep in mind. Oh, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, there are other things. Um, and what we wanted to understand is, yeah, is it just frequency response or what are the other parameters that are influencing uh, the per uh, perceived um, yeah, sound impression and what makes uh, some, a headphone sound good or sound bad. And uh, yeah, there are, as you said before, there are many other things. Uh, and it starts with a personal preference, of course. So when you have an average, you have to understand how statistics works. <laughs> and uh, there is a bunch of different opinions about it. And the, yes, when you put that together, yes, you get one curve, but one likes definitely more. And uh, uh, this is, is one thing. And things like, oh, this is a closed one, it's an open one. So the acoustical impedance of the headphone uh, angle of incidence of, of, of the sound um, to the ear, things like that, but not only, there are much more um, that are influencing the sound. THD, for example, yeah. is, is something uh, that is important as well. Um, all that, and they're not shown in just one curve. It's not possible to describe a headphone and its quality and its what it, uh, the sound that it, or the impression of sound that it, uh, creates in just one curve, it's not possible. And so all these reviewers who are doing, saying, okay, this is a good headphone because it matches this curve or it doesn't match, this is a bad one because it doesn't match, they have no idea about what they are talking about. Yeah, I, I mean, that is a, a bit of a, a <laughs> harsh criticism, I would it, say. It is like that, they should <laughs> definitely listen to the headphones and to understand, yeah. okay, this sounds really good, to me, and maybe it sounds bad for someone else, but yep. yeah, this is the way it is, but okay, yep. reviewer's business is something else, and um, so it's we have to understand it's it's not science, it's not think, bringing things forward, it's it's business, and um, yeah, so, but we are interested, of course, in doing business as well, so we have <laughs> to live, but we have, want to push uh, the limits um, of um, yes, understanding how headphone sound is perceived a little bit further, and we are working on that. Yeah, and uh, I, I would go. I mean, also a little bit in the defense of the reviewers, because if they um, say something yes. sort of against the Internet Hive mind, and uh, and they say this doesn't fit Harman at all, but I still like it, then we immediately get a, a lot of pushback. That's my, my experience. So I can understand that there is. Um, you, you need courage to, to do that. Um, but, but a very good example also from the Harman study is um, like the comparison of the HG650 and the HG800 um, because the uh, HG650 is online completely lauded for being very neutral um, because it fits Harman perfectly except for the bass or very close at least. And uh, the HG800 doesn't. So it has less bass, but it also has less mids and then it has a bit more treble. And um, obviously, they had the headphones weren't directly compared, but they virtualized the frequency response on an AKG K7.1 or 2 or something. And um, yet, in, in the research, the HG800 tuning came out, out on top. And that is a lesson in um, that the more you deviate doesn't necessarily mean that, that you are like in proportion worse. But it is always also an, a balancing act. So if you have less less base, then maybe it's sometimes a good idea to also lower the other region. And then it's not immediately the case that the headphone is double worse because it deviates in both regions. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that online, and I would agree with them, is the opinion is that the HG650 sounds more li li uh, lifelike or has maybe a better timbre in terms of instruments or something. Um, and, and yet the HG800 was preferred so, so in the Harman study. So that sort of shows, okay, w what does preference mean for Harman now? Because in the end, the internet will tell you that the tuning of the HG650 is better, but it is less preferred. On the, um, and the HG800 has this very detailed tuning, um, and that was preferred much more. So that also opens questions on, okay, so um, is what came out of 
this great study actually um, the same as what audiophiles deem as great sound. Yeah, so I think uh, when you see how the study is done, so they're listening to music for, yes, not a long period, so it's not long term listening. So it is more, yeah, short term and switching forth and back and things yeah. like that. So, and when you come from one sound and then switch to another, uh, it's very often so when it, yes, it widens and, and say, hey, that's cool, but uh, HD 800, uh, depending on, on the recordings, of course, could be very annoying. Mm -hmm. Showing you every detail, hearing fatigue is, is something that could happen. And so, yeah, I think all this is not reflected in the study. Yep. So, so uh, long-term listening to something shows you, and with different recordings and everything, is something that shows you really the quality of a headphone. Yeah. And uh, I, I guess one last, um, it's maybe anecdotal, but I, I still think it's worth a thought. Um, is um, I already talked about these separate headphones, which had statistically similar preference as a Harman target. Uh, um, so like the DT990 and the um, Sony M7506. And it's, it's striking that these headphones deviate so much from Harman uh, and people probably wouldn't say they are the most audiophile headphones ever, even though they have this huge preference rating. And I think that is maybe evidence for um, the for people just getting habituated to a certain kind of sound. Um, so people know that sound and they say, yeah, I like it, I'm used to it. And I, I think that is, uh, or to me it fills, us, it fills me with hope that there is a way to also change sort of the tuning going forward. So in, in the sense or that people prefer in the future so that it's not static and Harman will not necessarily be able to be recreated in 50 years exactly like that. But maybe over time, people will get used to having a bit more, more bass, for instance. Uh, so I have also come to the conclusion, finally, that I like a bit more bass than an HG 600 offers. <laughs> and um, I, I, that is a way that, that we also try to work as a company. And um, I, I hope that has also, let's say, that, that finds a fruitful ground also in the community. Yeah, so it's, it's, I think in, in total, it's not st uh, something static. So uh, sound preferences, and you see how the Harman curve develops over the time, uh, is something uh, that is influenced a lot by your experience, your listening experience as well. And of course, your listening experience is based on what you're listening to. So this is influencing your internal expectations, your internal equalizer settings. And uh, when something new is coming, uh, and it doesn't match these expectations, then the first reaction is, of course, and this is how, yes, we as, as humans behave always is, oh, I don't know it, it's, it's something wrong, so be careful. Yeah. Uh, and um, in a second and a third step, you get used to it and say, hey, okay. And when you, <laughs> then, and that's the funny thing with this more base, um, heavy tunings. So when you're listening to a headphone like that for a longer time and then you're switching back to something um, that is more what you've heard before with less bass, then if you will feel, okay, there's not enough bass, it's thin, it's, uh, yep. it's like that. And yep. so you get get used to that back again as well. So it's it's something very interesting, but it's not really something about headphones. It's more about how we behave as, as human beings. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that at least in terms of frequency response that covers most topics, one, one last note should be that whatever the target is, um, individual like preference trumps everything. So that is something that should be noted. So in the initial Harman study, they had like 15 test listeners and one test listener decreased from flat bass to minus 2 dB bass, and one test listener increased uh, the bass levels by 14 dB on loudspeakers. <laughs> and um, that, that just shows, and there were both test, li like trained and experienced listeners. So it's not that one person was deaf and the other wasn't, no. Um, that they both were like music enthusiasts, they, they 
worked at Harman at, at an audio company. And yet they were just so widely different that you could never accommodate for it with a single headphone. So that is something to keep in mind. If one person says, uh, well, you can't like this headphone, it has way too much bass or way too little treble, then you can just say, I have my own hearing, my own ears, and it sounds good to me and be confident in that. In that. So really just try to judge uh, headphones by your own preference because that's what's, what matters and not some judgment on the internet or squiggly lines that you see there. I just can agree on that. So trust your own ears, as I said for many years. At the end of all my presentations at Can Gems. <laughs> so it's yeah. like that. It's uh, only you, you and your ears can decide if the headphone sounds good to you or not. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think that concludes basically the topic of mostly frequency response based, uh, let's say, potential beyond Harman, because in the end the research is, is fantastic, but um, basically we, we just wanted to clear up what we feel are maybe the wrong interpretations of the research. So that isn't really criticism of the research at all. <laughs> and, uh, and next time we'll talk more about, okay, what is more to do there in the research? But uh, I think this is a very good topic to talk about because it's still getting uh, discussed every day on the internet. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for listening and uh, yeah, we continue with this in the next episode and yes, great when you could tune in again. Thank you very much. Thank you very Until much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Until then, bye-bye.